Jerusalem, city of Messiah. For thousands of years, the residents of this ancient walled city have looked forward to one who would, in the last days, stand just opposite the city on the Mount of Olives, save a remnant of his people, and rule the world in peace from Jerusalem. But where does the idea of Messiah find its roots? And what does the Messiah really mean to those who are looking for him? The Jewish foundation of Christianity, from promised Messiah to Jesus, on this day of discovery. How can the followers of two faiths that began as one have so much in common and yet be so far apart? More specifically, how can people who believe in the same Hebrew scriptures be so far apart on whether Jesus was the promised Jewish Messiah? It was that kind of question that recently led me to meet with two men who I knew have a personal and special interest in the identity and mission of the promised Messiah. Menno Kalischer is a Jewish man who now pastors a Jerusalem church. Avner Bosky is an Israeli guide, musician, and student of the Bible who lives in the south of Israel in the biblical town of Beersheba. Yeah, this is real beautiful. When I have believers coming to the land, I usually bring them here because this is such a valley of destiny, you know, so intimately connected with the life of Jesus. Kidron Valley. Yeah. Old well, walls of Jerusalem on yeah. the right here. What's that you have there? Who did I pick? That? Look at that. What this is, is that? A, this is a piece of pottery from Second Temple times. Oh, no, come on. Uh -huh, from the time of Jesus. Really? Yeah. You're guessing. No, 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 no. Why, no. why do you say that? Well, because of the way it's shaped. And uh, this is an area where a lot of junk has been thrown off the Temple Mount. And most of that junk came from the time of uh, Jesus, from the time of Yeshua. Let me see Hebrew that. <laughs> Man, do you believe him? Or do you think he's making that up? That's it very well could be. Yeah. It very well could be. Wow. Well, it, it certainly is a rich, rich spot. You know, one of the things, you, you stand here looking down the valley, the Kidron Valley. You've got Old Jerusalem on the right. You've got the Mount of Olives on the left. There's, you could almost say, looking down the valley, it's almost like you, you have Christianity on the left and Judaism on the right, right? Well, in a sense, of course, you know, in those days when Christianity began, everyone thought it was Jewish uh -huh. 2,000 years ago. And so when say you, that a different way. What do you mean? Well, when Jesus participated in the Last Supper, it was a Passover meal. Yeah. And when he died, people said, this is the Lamb of God, like a sacrificial lamb. When he walked right through this valley here, it was Passover. So there was an extremely Jewish context here where the Messiah came forth, born of his own people okay. for the whole world. Okay. And Absolutely. Be Basic Christianity is pure Judaism. Say that That's again. what it Say is. Say that again, another way. Basic Christianity is Biblical Judaism. The first generation of Jews who believe in Jesus, they didn't think, oh, we are Christians. No, for them, it's, wow, we used to have the shadow, we used to have the promises, now it has been fulfilled. That's what they had in their mind. They didn't think that they start a new religion. They were happy that things have been fulfilled in front of their eyes. Messiah okay. has come. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, I'm with you. That's and I, it. And actually, it was tongue-in-cheek when I said on the left is Christianity and on the right, because there is this rich, it's all, it was all no, Jewish. No, it's because you're a Gentile. You think you're like right, this. And, and why, you know, because I, I talk about and Christ. And I still, I love you. And, and, I, <laughs> and I talk about Christ, and I talk about Christianity, and it doesn't feel Jewish. Well, right? because, because most of your time, you sit in a place and you eat things only from the New Testament without looking what was the shadow. Remember that when God told Moses, build the temple, build everything, what did he tell him? In Exodus 25, he said, do it as the shadow I showed you. So when you look at the temple, you look at many things in the law, basically it's a shadow. It's, it's a, a shadow. It's a shadow. It's a foreshadowing of what would come, the fulfillment Absolutely, but of what was Jewish. is going to come. Yeah. Not a new religion. So are these men right? Could it be that the first followers of Christ had no intent of beginning a new religion? Not starting a new faith, 
seems to be in line with the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew saw the events of Jesus' birth as a fulfillment of what the prophets had foreseen. For instance, after Jesus' birth, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Matthew goes on to say that when Herod, the sitting king of the Jews, heard this, he inquired of Jewish religious experts about where this hope of the Jewish people was to be born. To answer his questions, the religious teachers of Jerusalem quoted the prophet Micah. He had written specifically about the location as Bethlehem. He wrote, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So from the Jewish prophets, the people of Israel knew of a coming ruler, a promised Messiah. But how is this Messiah linked to the Christ of Christianity? But the, even, even the word Christ in Christianity, what, I don't know, what does that mean? Anointed what? one, yeah. Anointed so, yeah, one, so. Christ, Christianity. The word Christ is a Greek word, Christos, which again refers to having oil poured on one's head yeah. as a kind of a being set apart. And in the Jewish context, in the Bible, it was Mashiach, which means the one who has been, had oil poured on him, set apart to be a prophet or a priest or a king. So in that sense, the word Christ is the equivalent of Messiah. It's a translation into Greek. So when we talk about Messianics, it's another way of saying Christians. followers of Christ. That's right. Yes. And if you say Christian, it's another way of saying in or about or following Messiah, right? The Absolutely. The original disciples, their first language would have been Hebrew or Aramaic. And so their first reference to Yeshua or Jesus, his Hebrew name, they would have said he's the Messiah, he's the Mashiach. It was only later when they moved into Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, and Greece that they began to use the Greek word Christos, which was more understandable in a foreign language. So in many ways, an important link to Jewish roots has been lost in translation. The same Greek language that became such an important means of communicating the story of Jesus outside of Israel, throughout the Roman Empire, simply translated the word Messiah as Christ. The meaning remained the same. So when the news of Jesus' death and resurrection spread north of Jerusalem to the Greek-speaking city of Antioch in Syria, those followers of Jesus were called by the name Christians, or the Christ Ones. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Acts chapter 11. While continuing to explore the important link between Jesus and the Jewish Messiah, we made our way along the wall of the old city of Jerusalem. Parts of the wall that supported Israel's temple complex can still be seen. We crossed the road and then turned to the east toward the Mount of Olives. As we walked down into the Kidron Valley and then up the other side, we continued to think together about how important the idea of Messiah is to Jewish history and to Jesus and his disciples who walked this same valley and the same Mount of Olives. These steps are fairly recent, are they? Yeah, I'd say about five years old. This is a new path for people who want to come down from the city of David and the Temple Mount into the Kidron Valley. Right so we're moving from the old walls above down to the Kidron Valley and then the, the Mount of Olives. Nobody's ever heard of the Mount of Olives, right? <laughs> uh. Probably the most famous mountain in Jerusalem. Hey, I got a question. We've been talking about the fact that, that Messiah and Christ, it's like they're equivalent. That's what we're saying, right? Christ means Messiah. Somebody says, but how important is that? I mean, making a big deal about it. And, do you, and if it's important, do you have to be Jewish to appreciate it? What would you say? Well, do you have to be Jewish a, to appreciate Messiah? It's a tricky question. Why? I'll explain why. As a Jew who have been born knowing and being taught of the Old Testament, you see many more colors. You can appreciate See more of more the colors, colors of, of the Messiah, of okay. identity, of right. what he's going to do and everything. Okay. 
Um, so yes, you can appreciate it. And why did I say it's tricky? That a Gentile may think that he has kind of a diet salvation. What diet? That means his salvation is only partial. You need to be a Jew in order to be saved. And that's the danger issue. Christ is all in all. If you didn't but know... But you can also say Messiah is all in all, Yes, right? it's the same. Yeah. Messiah is all in all. He is the end of the law, he is the target, he is the end result. If you have him, there are some things you can miss in the sides. That means you don't need to know all of what he has done. Uh -huh. If you know And yet there's him. color, there's richness there. Okay, so, yes. the, so the question is, what, what were the Jewish people looking for? Well, the fathers of Israel, the fathers and mothers of Israel. What, what, when they thought of Messiah and the hope of Messiah, what was in their mind? Well, you know, it's kind of like they say a text without a context is a pretext. And so when we're getting back into this issue of the Jewish roots of Messiah, we're getting back into the context of the situation out of which Jesus came. Out the of environment, which, the out background. Out of which he came and the hope as well, which is what we're talking about right now. The concept of Messiah goes back in the original Hebrew, the word Mashiach or Messiah, to the king. To the king? Saul was called the king, the Messiah, the Mashuach, because he was anointed with oil. It's kind of like a symbol of the Holy Spirit coming upon him to fulfill his calling. Okay, so you're saying Messiah means anointed. Anointed one, yeah. And the kings were anointed. Kings, prophets, priests. They were all anointed. All anointed. So in a sense, they were all Messiah. They right? were, well, the Jewish people are called the anointed people in Psalm 105, anointed for a purpose. Okay, this is getting confusing. No, it, you're, anointed, <laughs> no, listen, listen. you're anointed in that sense to do something for someone else. You're anointed to a job. You have a job description, which God says, I approve. It's the kosher stamp from God. I'm anointed. To, exactly, to do something. So in Hebrew, good I'm, house I'm, ha housekeeping seal of approval from God. Exactly. Okay, now, wait, now we've taken an idea and, and it's gotten huge, it's become all-encompassing. The nation is anointed, the nation is Messiah, the Messiah of God, the priest, the prophet, the king, the Messiah of God. So where does this idea of one personal? Well, with Saul, of course, there was only one king, unless, you know, you have revolution and splitting up of the kingdom, but the concept was only one king and only one dynasty. So with David, you hit the dynasty, the main king in the concept of David's seed forever and ever would be the anointed dynasty. Another Messiah, and anointed yeah, of God for his a, purpose. A dynasty which is anointed. And in oh, you've gone from the person, the king, to the from dynasty. From the king to the dynasty. That's the Davidic promise in 2 Samuel 7. And in one of those kings from David's dynasty would not only reign over Israel and Judah, but it says in Psalm 89, he would reign over the entire earth. And that's where the origin of the word Messiah Okay, so from. the Messiah all by itself is not just about one person, but you're saying that the scriptures unfold that to the anticipation of one who would be a greater than all other messiahs, all other anointed ones. Is that super, yeah. super king? I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. Psalm 89. He is the ultimate one that in him, he has everything. He is also the prophet, he is also the king, he is also the high priest, he is everything. All the others basically only took part. And he, all in all. This is the idea. And this information for some people maybe sound as if, ah, oh, it's a very New Testament idea. Not at all. I mean, for example, when Jesus as a baby, a um, few days old, entered to the temple with his parents. He went to the temple. They took, I him, mean, to the... They took him to the temple, the dedication of the child and so on. Yeah. Okay. Who have seen him? Hannah and Sh Simeon, correct? Who saw him. Exactly. They, they were okay. The, the Hannah two was people. very... Yes, two people have seen him. In the, the temple. Exactly. They have seen a baby. That would be Anna and Simeon. Hannah and Simeon. In Hebrew, which is more correct, okay. Hannah and Shimon. And the idea is that they have seen a baby in their hand. And what did they say? We have seen God's ultimate purpose. He is the one who is going to rule. He is the one who is going to bring the glory to God. But they have seen a baby. Okay, and you're saying, so that reflects the, the anticipation of the congregation of Israel. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, Simeon took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, 
Now you are letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. It's kind of like zooming in on a camera. You start from the anointed people, Israel, chosen by God for a purpose. Then you get to the tribe of Judah, the house of David, where you get the dynasty, the royal dynasty. And then you get that one person in the royal dynasty who's the Messiah, who will be the ultimate king over the whole world. Uh, it's so, all in the so, same context. So it's this one idea of Messiah that keeps becoming refined refined and more specific yeah. until yeah. until it becomes everything again right, That's right. well basically it's god and how do yeah. you see i mean maybe i can inject something who was number two for moses joshua correct he was his assistant exactly yes. right. now who was number two for joshua no one okay no one caleb right. ben yefune caleb was as equivalent to Joshua. It, he was not his number two. That means okay. going to rule after Joshua. All right. Because Moses brought the people to the land, not in the land, to the land. Joshua brings them into the land, but after they're in the promised land, God is the king. God is the king. There are 12 tribes. Levites are in the temple. God is the king. Joshua does not need number two. So the mindset as a principle was there always. They had a shadow, but they knew exactly, or in, in a sense, by God's love and grace, the purpose. Okay. Now you keep talking about the land, the people being in the land. And when we talk about Messiah, the, the land itself takes on a richness, doesn't it? Because the, the, people, the people who lived in this land were looking forward to that Messiah, the people who were buried. In fact, talk to me about the the Mount of Olives. It's, it's, it has a messianic dimension to it's it. It's that threefold chord. You know, you got the land of Israel, the people of Israel, and the Messiah of Israel. The whole plan isn't going to work until all three come together. And right into the middle of this scene here, you have uh, Jesus walking right through this valley of the Kidron. This is the Kidron Valley or the Jehoshaphat Valley, where it says all the nations of the world are going to get judged in uh, Joel chapter uh, 3 and 4. And then you have moving up through the area of the tombs, because this goes back to Zechariah 14, where it says the resurrection of the dead is going to happen on this mountain. And Messiah himself is going to return to this mountain. His feet are going to stand on the Mount of Olives. So this whole scenario here, the Garden of Gethsemane, all the graves, the Jewish graves of the Mount of Olives, it's all connected to the Messianic hope and the concept that when God is going to come back to this earth, his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Look at the cemetery. I mean, there are so many hills and mountains around. This is a major cemetery. Why? Of a messianic hope. I mean, because people, of the messianic hope. Absolutely. I mean, the way people live, the way people do things, especially the way people say, I want to be buried here. It's a lesson of theology. <laughs> Why? Why? Because the feet of Christ are going to step here upon his arrival to earth, in his second coming to earth. Where do you get that? Yeah, I, Zechariah, it's Zechariah 14. chapter 14. Zechariah 14. And in Daniel chapter 12, we know that in his coming there is resurrection. So in a Jewish mindset, I want to be there when his feet are there because next to his feet there is life. So Mena, would you say that this mountain here with Zechariah, this chapter 14, this is something precious both to Jews and to Christians, isn't that right? Absolutely, because it says upon his arrival, all saints with him. Look at me. I look so ugly, but when God look at me, I'm a saint, you know, and we're going to, saints are going to come with the Lord. So those who believe in Christ Jesus as the Lord, know they'll come with him. Those who anticipate the Messiah as Messiah, know he's going to be here and are buried here. Some look for the shadow without to know. Some others know it intimately, but this is the result. So this mountain connects the Jewish messianic hope and the Christian hope as well. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. As Avner and Menno indicated, it was the Hebrew prophet Zechariah who in the sixth century before Christ foresaw the Messiah coming to the Mount of Olives to intervene in a war between his people 
and the nations of the world. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations, as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. Zechariah chapter 14. But how does this hope of Israel link to followers of Jesus who, every year on the Sunday before Easter, gather here on the Mount of Olives? They march down the hillside and into Jerusalem because according to the New Testament, it was from this Mount of Olives that Jesus came into Jerusalem, declared by adoring crowds as their long-awaited Messiah a week before his crucifixion. While the days and hours that followed hardly seem like the kind of conquering intervention that Zechariah predicted, the New Testament implies that Jesus' voluntary death for sin, followed three days later by his bodily resurrection, was the beginning of messianic deliverance. Then, 40 days later, after many reported appearances to his disciples and more than 500 others, the Gospels indicate that Jesus met his disciples one last time on this same Mount of Olives. It was on that occasion that his disciples asked him whether it was at this time that he was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. In response, the teacher told them that it was not for them to know the times or seasons of God's plan. Instead, he told them that he was going to give them his Holy Spirit to enable them to tell the residents of Jerusalem, Judea, and the whole world what he had done to provide spiritual rescue. Now when Jesus had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Acts chapter 1. 2,000 years later, as Avner, Menno, and I stood on that same Mount of Olives, it seems so clear that if the Messiah's work has begun, it's not yet complete. Even though many have not accepted that a crucified Messiah could be a part of God's plan, the world still desperately needs the messianic hope that the prophet Isaiah foresaw. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Isaiah chapter 2 Today as I think back to the olive trees and graveyards of the Mount of Olives, I realize that there's something I don't ever want to forget. I always want to remember how that same prophet Isaiah mysteriously pictures the Messiah King as a sacrificial lamb that dies for sin before his life is prolonged in honor. But that's a thought that begs for another conversation that would soon follow.